In the ancient hills of Ireland, beneath skies that stretched endlessly, people whispered stories. These weren't just tales to pass the time, they were more than that. They were stories filled with power, connecting the people to their land, to the unseen forces that shaped their lives. Every symbol carved into stone, every being that walked between worlds, held meaning. In Celtic culture, these symbols and mythical beings were not just characters of old tales, they lived among the people, shaping their beliefs, their identities, and the way they viewed the world. There was the mighty oak tree, standing tall in the forests, its roots reaching deep into the earth. The Celts believed the oak was a symbol of strength and wisdom, a sacred guardian of the land. To them, the oak was not just a tree, it was alive, breathing with the spirit of the earth, whispering secrets that only those who listened could hear. The Celts would gather under its branches, feeling its strength, trusting that it would protect them, just as it had protected their ancestors. And then there was the Morrigan, the mysterious goddess who could shapeshift into a raven. Her presence was felt in the stillness before battle, her wings cutting through the air like a warning. To the Celts, she wasn't just a figure of fear, she was a guide, a protector in the chaos of war. They knew that her presence meant something important, fate was at work. The Morrigan wasn't there to cause harm, but to guide the souls of the fallen, to ensure that they found their way to the afterlife. Symbols, too, had their own stories to tell. The triskeel, with its three spirals, held meaning far beyond its simple design. To the Celts, it represented the cycle of life, the endless movement of time. Each curve of the spiral spoke of birth, life, and death, all intertwined in an eternal dance. It was a reminder that life never truly ended, that there was always another turn in the spiral, another beginning. Holding onto that symbol, they carried with them the hope that even in the hardest moments, there was always another chance. The puka was a creature that could appear in the night, shapeshifting between forms, sometimes helpful, sometimes mischievous. You never knew what to expect from the puka, but that was part of its charm. It reminded the Celts that life wasn't always predictable, that sometimes things didn't go as planned. But instead of fearing this, they embraced it, knowing that the unexpected was part of the magic of life. The puka, with its playful spirit, kept them on their toes, teaching them that even in chaos, there could be beauty. Bridget, the goddess of fire and healing, held a different kind of power. Her warmth was felt in the hearth, where families gathered for comfort, and in the fields, where crops grew under her watchful eye. To the Celts, Bridget was more than a goddess, she was family. She was the warmth in their homes, the strength in their bodies, the healing in their hearts. When they prayed to Bridget, they weren't just asking for help, they were speaking to someone who understood their struggles, who walked with them in their pain, and who offered hope in the face of hardship. The Banshee, with her mournful wails, brought a different kind of message. To the untrained ear, her cries were terrifying, a sound that sent shivers down the spine. But to those who understood, the Banshee was not a figure of terror. Her voice, though sad, was a reminder that death was a part of life. Her cry foretold the passing of a loved one, giving the family time to prepare, to say their goodbyes. Though her presence was feared, it was also respected. She reminded the Celts that even in the darkest times, there was a thread of connection, a moment of understanding between the living and the dead. The Celtic knot, with its never-ending loops, represented something much deeper than just a pattern. Each twist and turn of the knot symbolized the connections between people, the ties that bound them to each other and to the world around them. It wasn't just a decorative design, it was a symbol of life's complexity, of the bonds that could never be broken, no matter how tangled or difficult things became. The Celts carried this symbol with them, knowing that no matter how far they wandered, they were never truly alone. And then there was the salmon of knowledge, a fish said to hold all the wisdom of the world. To the Celts, knowledge wasn't just about facts or learning, it was something living, something that could be found in the most unexpected places. The story of the boy who ate the salmon and gained all its wisdom was more than just a legend, it was a lesson. It taught them that wisdom came not from power, but from patience, from waiting for the right moment to learn the truths hidden in the world around them. The Dullahan, the headless horseman who rode through the night, brought with him the certainty of death. But even this figure, terrifying as he was, held a place of honor in Celtic belief. 
He was not just a bringer of death, but a guide to the afterlife, ensuring that souls found their way to the next world. Though the sight of him could cause fear, the Celts knew that his presence was part of the cycle of life, a necessary step in the journey that everyone would one day take. Each symbol, each being, carried with it a message, a lesson, a piece of wisdom passed down through generations. These stories weren't just told for entertainment, they were woven into the very fabric of Celtic life. They taught the people how to live, how to face their fears, how to find strength in the natural world around them. Through these beings and symbols, the Celts saw themselves. They saw their hopes, their fears, their struggles, and their triumphs reflected in the myths that surrounded them. These symbols and beings were more than just figures from the past. They lived in the hearts of the people, guiding them through the hardships of life, offering comfort in times of sorrow, and reminding them of the power that lay in the unseen forces of the world. Through them, the Celts found meaning in the chaos of life, a connection to something greater than themselves. And even now, these symbols still hold that power, reminding us that the stories of the past are never truly forgotten. They live on, in every oak tree, in every spiral, in every whispered story that echoes through the hills. The sky darkened as crows gathered, their black wings cutting through the air. There was a stillness, an eerie silence before battle. Soldiers gripped their swords tighter, their breath caught in their throats. They had seen this before, the ominous shadow of the Morrigan, the goddess who foretold death and decided the fate of warriors. She was more than just a figure from legend. She was present, always watching, always waiting. In the heat of war, when swords clashed and blood stained the earth, the Morrigan was there. Her presence was felt in the chaos, her voice carried in the cries of the crows overhead. She was feared and respected. Soldiers whispered her name, knowing that the outcome of the battle was not in their hands, but in hers. The Morrigan didn't fight with weapons. Her power was far greater. She could control destiny, shape the future, and decide who would live and who would fall. Appearing often as a crow or raven, she soared above the battlefield, her dark wings a symbol of death. Those who saw her knew what it meant. To see the Morrigan was to know that your time was near. Yet, her presence wasn't just about fear. There was something strangely comforting in knowing she was there, watching over the battlefield like a silent judge. She wasn't evil, she was simply fate in its rawest form, neither good nor bad, just inevitable. Her connection to death wasn't one of malice. The Morrigan didn't delight in the destruction or the chaos of war. She was there to guide the souls of the fallen, to make sure they found their way. Her power stretched far beyond the battlefield. She was a guardian of the dead, leading them through the veil between life and the afterlife. And in those moments, as life slipped away, she was the last thing many would see, a guide through the darkness. But the Morrigan wasn't just a goddess of death. She held the power of prophecy, a gift that was as terrifying as it was profound. She could see what others could not, the shape of things to come. She would appear to those who needed to hear her warnings, often in dreams or visions, showing them glimpses of the future. These visions weren't always clear, but they were never wrong. The Morrigan didn't just predict fate, she controlled it, bending it to her will, guiding the flow of time like a river she could shape with her hands. Warriors would sometimes hear her call, a voice carried on the wind before a great battle. They knew then what was to come. Some would fight harder, hoping to defy the fate they knew was sealed. Others accepted it, knowing that their time had come, and that the Morrigan had chosen them to cross into the next world. Her presence wasn't one of mercy, but it wasn't cruelty either. She was a force, unstoppable and relentless, carrying with her the weight of fate itself. Her connection to crows and ravens was no accident. These birds were symbols of death and transformation, scavengers who fed on the dead but also carried with them a sense of mystery and power. The Morrigan often appeared as one of these birds, watching, waiting, deciding. The crows circled the battlefield, their cries mixing with the clash of swords and the shouts of men. But to those who understood, those who knew the stories, the crows were more than just birds, they were the Morrigan herself, overseeing the fight, choosing the victors, and the fallen. 
In the quiet moments after the battle, when the ground was soaked with blood and the cries of the dying faded, the Morgan's work was not yet done. She moved among the dead, silent and unseen, collecting the souls of those who had fallen. She was not gentle, but she was not cruel. She was a force of nature, like the wind or the rain, doing what needed to be done. The dead belonged to her, and she would guide them to the other side, to whatever awaited them beyond this life. There were stories of warriors who tried to bargain with her, to change their fate. They would offer her prayers, sacrifices, anything to escape the end they knew was coming. But the Morrigan could not be swayed. Fate was fate, and even she, with all her power, was bound to it. Those who fought hardest against her often found themselves falling even quicker, as if the very act of resisting their destiny sealed it even more tightly. Yet, for all her power and fearsome nature, there was something about the Morgan that inspired awe. She was not like other gods, distant and detached. She was present, always watching, always involved. To the Celts, she wasn't just a goddess to fear, but a reminder of life's fragility. She showed them that no matter how strong they were, no matter how skilled in battle, death was a part of life, unavoidable and ever-present. The Morrigan also had a role beyond death. She was a goddess of life, of fertility, of the land itself. She represented the cycles of life and death, the constant turning of the wheel. Just as the land needed to die in the winter to be reborn in the spring, so too did people need to face their mortality. The Morrigan's connection to the earth was as strong as her connection to death. She was the land, the water, the very air the Celts breathed. She was everything, and without her, life would cease to exist. Her presence was felt not only in times of war, but in the everyday struggles of life. Farmers would sometimes see a crow sitting on a fence post and know that the Morrigan was watching them, perhaps warning them of hard times to come. Mothers would tell their children stories of the Morrigan, reminding them to be brave, to face their fears, because the Morrigan saw all and knew all. She wasn't a goddess to be loved, but she was one to be respected, for her power was beyond comprehension. The Morrigan's legacy lived on in every battle, in every crow's cry, in every shadow that moved just out of sight. She was always there, a reminder that life and death were two sides of the same coin, and that no matter how hard one tried to escape fate, it would always find you in the end. The Morrigan wasn't cruel, but she was unforgiving. She was fate itself, unstoppable and ever-present, guiding the world with her dark wings and her watchful eyes. The Celts didn't just believe in the Morrigan, they lived with her. She was in their stories, their prayers, their very breath. She was a part of them, just as she is a part of us, even now. Her power, her presence, her unyielding strength, it's something that resonates, even in the quiet moments when the crows gather, and the world seems still, waiting for what comes next. In the heart of the forest, where the trees stand tall and the air is thick with the scent of moss and earth, there is a presence that can be felt, but not always seen. The animals know him well, and so do the winds that whisper through the leaves. His name is Senenos, the Horned God, the Keeper of the Wild, and the embodiment of the untamed forces of nature. His figure, ancient and powerful, has stood the test of time, watching over the earth with quiet strength. Senenos doesn't belong to the cities or the places where humans have tamed the land. He belongs to the wild, where life and death dance together in an eternal cycle. He is the pulse that runs through the forests, the rivers, the fields. The Celts knew him as the god of nature, fertility, and animals, a being that stood between the human world and the wild one, connecting them in ways that are sometimes hard to understand but impossible to ignore. The image of Sunanos, with his great antlers, speaks of something ancient, something older than any civilization. His horns, like those of a stag, reach up to the sky, connecting the earth to the heavens. He is often seen sitting cross-legged, calm and patient, holding a serpent in one hand and a torque in the other. The serpent, with its coiled body, represents the endless cycle of life, death, and rebirth, while the torque, a symbol of wealth and power, reminds us of the gifts that the wild can give to those who respect it. But Senenos is not just a god of bounty. He is the god of the wild, of the untamed, of the parts of nature that cannot be controlled. 
In the silence of the forest, in the rustle of the leaves, in the eyes of the animals that watch from the shadows, there is a reminder of his presence. He is the breath of the stag running through the woods, the strength of the bear, the grace of the deer. His spirit lives in every creature, every tree, every stream that flows through the land. For the Celts, Sunanos wasn't just a distant figure. He was close, present in their lives through the land they lived on. Farmers would look to him for fertility, hoping that the earth would give them a bountiful harvest. Hunters would pray to him before setting out, asking for his blessing to find food, but also giving thanks for the life they would take. They knew that Sunanos watched over the balance of nature, and to take without giving back was to disrupt that balance. He was the guardian of the natural world, and those who respected it honored him. In the presence of Sunanos, there is a feeling of awe, but also a feeling of being small. He reminds us of how vast the world truly is, how wild and untamed it remains despite all human efforts to control it. The forest, with its tangled branches and hidden paths, is his home, a place where life thrives without the interference of man. The animals that roam the woods, the birds that soar through the sky, the fish that swim in the rivers, they are all under his protection, part of his domain. There is something almost primal about Sunenos, something that calls to a deep part of the human soul. His power is not the kind that shouts or demands attention. It is quiet, like the steady beat of a drum in the distance. But it is there, ever-present, a reminder of the forces of nature that continue on, no matter what. His energy flows through the roots of the trees, through the rivers, through the very soil beneath our feet. He is life itself, raw and untamed. In Sunanos, the Celts saw not only the god of the wild, but also the god of fertility. He was the one who made the crops grow, who ensured that animals would multiply, that life would continue. His presence meant abundance, but only for those who respected the natural world. The earth, under his care, would give generously, but it would also take back what was needed to maintain balance. Sunanos was not a god of endless wealth or easy prosperity, he was a god who demanded that life be honored in all its forms. As the god of animals, Sunanos had a deep connection to the creatures of the earth. The stag, with its majestic antlers, was his sacred animal, representing the untamed spirit of the wild. But he was also connected to the serpent, a creature of transformation, of life and death. The duality of these animals, one strong and noble, the other mysterious and ever-changing, reflected the dual nature of Sunanos himself. He was both protector and destroyer, both life and death, embodying the cycle that governs all of nature. To see Sunanos in the quiet of the woods is to understand the wildness that lives inside us all. He speaks to the part of us that longs for freedom, for a connection to the earth that we have lost in our modern world. In his gaze, there is a reminder that we are not separate from nature but a part of it. The wildness that Sunanos represents is not something to fear, but something to respect. It is a force that can give life, but also one that can take it away. Even now, the spirit of Sunanos lingers in the forests and fields, in the places where the wild still thrives. His presence is felt in the rustling of leaves, in the call of animals, in the quiet moments when the earth seems to breathe. He is the guardian of the wild places, the protector of the untamed, and his power is one that will never fade. Those who walk through the woods, who feel the pull of the earth beneath their feet, who sense the life that pulses in every tree and every creature, are still touched by the presence of Sunanos, the horned god. The mist rolled across the land, thick and silent, covering everything in a blanket of stillness. It was the kind of quiet that made the hairs on the back of your neck stand up, the kind that whispered of something unseen, something ancient. Somewhere in that mist, a figure stood, watching. Aram, Lord of the Underworld, Ruler of End, the Land of the Dead. His presence was not one of fear, but of an overwhelming sense of power, a force that could not be ignored. Aram wasn't like other gods of death, cloaked in shadows and terror. He ruled over the Otherworld with a quiet dignity, a calm authority that spoke of the mysteries of life and death. And, the land he governed, wasn't a place of torment or eternal suffering. It was a place where the souls of the dead found rest, a place of beauty and peace, though it was hidden from the living world. The line between life and death was thin, and Aram stood at the threshold, guiding souls through it. 
To the Welsh, Arion was not a figure to be feared, but one to be respected. He was the keeper of the afterlife, the one who ensured that the dead were cared for and given the peace they deserved. His connection to death wasn't about punishment or fear. It was about the natural end of life, the passing from one state of existence to another. Under his rule, the other world was a realm of shadows and mystery, but also of beauty and tranquility. Those who entered it found not terror, but the peace that eluded them in life. Arout's kingdom was not easily reached by mortals, and was a hidden place, beyond the veil of what the living could see. But there were moments, brief and fleeting, when the borders between worlds would blur, and those who were brave enough, or perhaps foolish enough, could find themselves wandering into his domain. It was said that on nights when the mist was thick and the wind was silent, you could hear the sound of his hounds, the CWN and howling in the distance. These spectral hounds were not to be taken lightly. Their cries signaled that the veil between life and death had thinned, and that Arounts' gaze was upon the living world. Those who heard the hounds knew what it meant. The hunt was on. Arounts' hounds were relentless, chasing down those who had wandered too close to the borders of his realm. But they were not hunters of flesh. They hunted souls, guiding the lost and the dying to the afterlife. Their howls were not a warning of danger, but a signal that the time had come for the soul to move on, to pass from the world of the living into the care of our realm. The sound of those hounds sent chills down the spine of anyone who heard them, but it was not out of fear of death itself. It was the knowledge that death was near, that the time to face our round and his domain was approaching. And though his hounds were feared, Aron himself was not. He was a fair and just ruler, guiding the souls of the dead with kindness. The afterlife under his care was not a place of torment, but a place where the weariness of life could be shed, where souls could finally rest. Aron's connection to the supernatural went beyond just his rule over the dead. He was a master of the unknown, the keeper of mysteries that no living soul could comprehend. He understood the thin line between life and death, the fragility of existence. In his hands, that line was something delicate, something that could be crossed with the right guidance. He was not just a god of death, but a guardian of the transition between worlds, the one who ensured that no soul was lost in the darkness. There are tales of those who encountered Aron not just in death, but in life. One of the most famous is the story of Pool, a mortal king who, through a strange twist of fate, exchanged places with Aron for a year. During that time, Pool ruled and in Aron's stead, while Aron lived among mortals. It was a test of trust, a bond formed between the mortal world and the other world. Aron's power was great, but he was not without mercy or kindness. He gave Pool his trust, and in return, Pool honored him with loyalty. The story of Pool and Aron speaks to the duality of Aron's nature. He is the Lord of the Dead, but he is also connected to life. He understands both worlds in ways that mortals cannot, and he moves between them with ease. His role is not to judge or to punish, but to guide, to ensure that the natural order of life and death is maintained. His connection to the other world is one of balance, of ensuring that the dead find their place, but also that the living continue their journey without interference from the supernatural. Yet for all his power, Aron is a quiet figure. He doesn't seek attention or glory. His presence is felt in the stillness of the night, in the whispers of the wind, in the moments when life and death seem to touch. He is the shadow that passes just out of sight, the figure that watches over the world without needing to be seen. Aron's power is subtle, but it is vast. He is always there, always watching, ensuring that the natural order of things is preserved. To encounter Aron is to face the unknown, to come face to face with the mysteries that lie beyond life. But there is no terror in his gaze. There is only understanding. He knows the fears of mortals, the uncertainty that comes with death. But in his presence, there is also a sense of peace, a sense that everything is as it should be. Aron's domain may be one of shadows, but it is also a place of rest, a place where the souls of the dead can find the peace that eluded them in life. The lord of the underworld, Aron, is not just a god of death. He is the keeper of the afterlife, the guardian of souls, the one who ensures that the dead are never forgotten. His power is quiet, but it is unyielding. He watches over the other world with care, 
ensuring that the balance between life and death is never broken. And for those who find themselves on the threshold of his domain, there is no need for fear. In our own hands, death is not the end, it is simply another part of the journey. In the quiet moments before dawn, when the world is still and the earth feels like it's holding its breath, there is a presence that stirs. It is gentle, nurturing, and ancient beyond measure. Her name is whispered in the winds and carried by the rivers. She is Danu, the mother of the Tuatha Dé Danann, the one from whom all life flows. Her essence is woven into the fabric of the land, the sky, and the waters that give life to all things. Danu is more than a goddess, she is the very soul of the earth. The silts felt her presence in the rain that nourished their crops, in the rivers that ran through their lands, and in the wisdom that guided their people. She was the mother of their gods, the Tuatha Dé Danann, a tribe of divine beings who ruled Ireland with grace and power. But Danu was more than just a mother to gods, she was a mother to the earth itself, to its people, its animals, and its plants. Her love for the world was vast and endless, like the rivers she was so closely connected to. Water was sacred to Danu. It flowed from her, nourishing the land, quenching the thirst of those who walked upon it, and offering wisdom to those who listened to its whispers. The rivers that wound through the land were not just bodies of water, they were living veins of her spirit, carrying life and knowledge to all who would receive it. There was something in the way the water moved, something sacred and wise, as if it held secrets older than time itself. Danu's wisdom was like the waters, clear, steady, and deep. Those who sought her guidance found not the loud, booming voice of a war god, but the quiet, sure whisper of a mother who had seen it all. She knew the rhythms of life, the cycles of birth and death, the ebb and flow of time. Her wisdom wasn't forceful, it didn't demand attention. It was simply there, waiting for those who were willing to listen. The Celts looked to Danu not just as a source of life, but as a source of fertility. She was the force that caused the crops to grow, that made the animals multiply, that ensured the survival of the people. Her touch was in the earth beneath their feet, in the seeds they planted, in the rain that fell from the sky. Every harvest, every birth, was a testament to her power. The world bloomed under her care, and in return, the people offered her their love and reverence. Yet, Danu's role as a mother was not just about the physical world. She was the mother of wisdom, the one who nurtured the minds and spirits of her children. Her teachings were not given through commands, but through the quiet lessons of the earth itself. The way the seasons changed, the way the rivers flowed, the way life emerged from the soil, these were the teachings of Danu. She reminded her people that wisdom could be found in the most ordinary of places, in the simple act of living in harmony with the earth. The Tuatha Dé Danann, Danu's children, were a reflection of her power and grace. They were gods and goddesses of great skill, beauty, and wisdom, and they carried her essence within them. Through them, Danu's influence spread across the land, touching every corner of the world they ruled. But even in their greatness, the Tuatha Dé Danann always looked back to their mother, knowing that it was from her that they drew their strength. Danu's connection to water was not just about life, it was also about transformation. Just as rivers shaped the land, wearing away stone and carving new paths, Danu shaped the lives of those who followed her. She understood that life was a constant flow, always moving, always changing. Nothing remained still, just as the water never stopped flowing. Those who sought her blessings found themselves transformed, their lives reshaped by the wisdom and love she offered. In the stillness of a quiet river, there is a reflection of Danu's power. Her presence is felt in the way the water moves, in the life that thrives along its banks, and the peace that comes from simply sitting beside it and listening. There is something eternal about her, something that transcends time and space. She is both the river and the sky, the earth and the wind. She is everywhere and everything, watching over her children with a love that knows no bounds. For the Celts, Danu was not just a goddess to be worshipped, she was a part of their daily lives. Her spirit lived in every drop of rain, and every gust of wind, and every blade of grass that grew beneath their feet. They didn't just call upon her in times of need, they felt her presence in the very act of living. She was the earth itself, the source of all life, and her love for the world was as endless as the sky. 
there was something profoundly comforting about Danu's presence. She wasn't a goddess of war or destruction, but a goddess of life, of nurturing, of love. Her power wasn't in weapons or battles, but in the quiet, steady strength of a mother's love. She didn't need to raise her voice to command respect. Her power was felt in the way the earth responded to her touch, in the way the waters flowed under her care, in the way life blossomed wherever she cast her gaze. To feel Danu's presence was to be reminded of the sacredness of life. It was to understand that every drop of water, every breath of air, every moment of existence was a gift. She taught her people to respect the earth, to honor the cycles of life, to live in harmony with the world around them. Her lessons were not about power or domination, they were about love, about care, about understanding the delicate balance that sustains all life. In every stream, in every river, in every wellspring of water, there was Danu. Her spirit flowed through the world, touching everything it passed, offering life and wisdom to all who sought it. She was the mother of the gods, the mother of the earth, and the mother of all life. Her love was vast and boundless, and under her care, the world flourished. The fire crackled softly, casting a warm glow that danced across the faces of those gathered around it. In the flickering flames, there was a presence, something ancient and powerful, Brigid, goddess of healing, poetry, and fire. Her spirit lingered in the heat of the hearth, in the gentle words of a poet, in the hands of a healer as they mended the wounded. To speak her name was to invoke warmth, creativity, and life itself. She wasn't just a figure of myth, she was a force that lived in the everyday, in the hearts of those who honored her. Bridget's power was felt in every fire that kept the cold at bay, in every word that carried hope or wisdom, and in every act of healing that soothed the pain of the broken. She wasn't confined to one role or one title. She was the warmth of the hearth, the spark of inspiration, the soothing hand that healed wounds. Bridget was many things to many people, and in every aspect of her being, she was deeply loved. In her role as a goddess of healing, Bridget's touch was gentle yet powerful. She understood the fragility of the human body and the pain that came with illness and injury. But more than that, she understood the strength of the human spirit, the way it could endure, the way it could rise from the ashes of suffering. In every herb that grew in the fields, and every spring of clear water, there was Bridget's gift of healing. Her hands, though unseen, were always present, guiding the healers as they tended to the sick and the weary. But Bridget's healing was not just physical. She mended more than just bodies, she healed hearts and minds. There was a comfort in her presence, a reminder that even in the darkest of times, there was hope. To feel her touch was to feel a warmth that soothed the soul, that whispered of renewal and life. She reminded her people that healing wasn't just about curing an ailment, it was about restoring balance, about finding peace even in the midst of pain. Bridget was also the goddess of poetry, and through her, words became something more than just a means of communication. They became a way to express the deepest emotions, the rawest truths. In every poem that stirred the heart, in every song that brought tears to the eyes, Bridget's spirit was there, inspiring those who had the courage to speak their truth. She was the muse of the bards, the one who gifted them with words that could move mountains, that could bring both laughter and sorrow. To write a poem, to sing a song, was to honor Bridget. It was to take part in the act of creation, to give form to something intangible. And in every line of poetry, in every note of music, there was a part of Bridget herself, a spark of divine inspiration that reminded the world of the power of words. She knew that words had the ability to heal, to comfort, to bring people together. And so, through poetry, she nurtured the human spirit, giving it a voice when words alone were not enough. Fire was perhaps the most sacred of Bridget's gifts. It was both a symbol of her power and a manifestation of her presence. The hearth fire was more than just a source of warmth, it was the heart of the home, the place where families gathered, where stories were told, where food was shared. It was in this fire that Bridget's spirit burned brightest, keeping the cold and darkness at bay. The flames that danced in the hearth were a reflection of her own fiery nature, a power that could warm, heal, and inspire, but also one that could destroy if not respected. Bridget's fire was not to be feared, but to be honored. It represented life, passion, and creativity. 
Just as a fire needs tending to keep burning, so too did the creative spirit need nurturing to thrive. Bridget was the guardian of that fire, ensuring that it never died out, that it continued to burn brightly in the hearts of her people. She reminded them that creativity was not a luxury, it was a necessity, something that kept the spirit alive and gave meaning to life. Even as Christianity spread across the land, Bridget's presence did not fade. In fact, she became a bridge between the old and the new. The goddess Bridget was transformed into Saint Bridget, but her essence remained the same. She was still the healer, the poet, the keeper of the fire. Her spirit lived on in the traditions of the people, in the way they continued to honor her through acts of kindness, through the telling of stories, through the lighting of sacred fires. Bridget's festival, Imbolc, marked the beginning of spring, a time of renewal and rebirth. It was a time when the cold grip of winter began to loosen, and the first signs of life appeared once more. The people would light fires in her honor, asking for her blessings for the coming year, for healing, for inspiration, for protection. They knew that Bridget's presence was not bound by time or place, she was eternal, a goddess who lived in the very heart of the land. Bridget was a goddess who embodied both strength and tenderness. She was fierce in her love for her people, and her desire to protect and heal them. But she was also gentle, like the warmth of a fire on a cold night, like the soft words of a poem that touches the heart. Her power wasn't in grand displays of force, but in the quiet moments of connection, in the acts of creation and care that brought people together. In every aspect of life, Bridget's influence could be felt. She was the fire that kept families warm, the words that stirred the soul, the healing touch that mended the broken. She was a goddess of the people, and her love for them was as constant as the flame she kept burning. Through her, they found not only strength and inspiration, but also comfort and peace. To know Bridget was to know the heart of life itself. It was to understand that in every act of creation, in every moment of healing, in every word spoken with love, there was a spark of the divine. Bridget was that spark, the eternal flame that burned within each person, reminding them that even in the hardest of times, there was always light. In the golden light of early morning, when the first rays of the sun break over the horizon, there is a moment where the world feels touched by something greater. This is the moment of love, the shining God, whose presence brings warmth, skill, and mastery to all he touches. He is not just a God of light, but a God of brilliance, of craftsmanship, knowledge, and the gifts that flow from human hands and hearts. Luff, in all his radiant glory, stands at the crossroads of skill and spirit, lighting the way for those who seek to excel in their craft, their art, and their lives. Luff's story is one of brilliance in every sense of the word. Born to both divine and mortal parents, his very existence was a fusion of two worlds, and from this union, he inherited the strength and wisdom of both. His skills were unmatched, his knowledge vast. Whether it was wielding a spear in battle, playing music that could bring tears to the eyes, or crafting tools that could shape the world, Luff excelled in all he touched. He was the master of many arts, and in him, the Silt saw the embodiment of excellence. It is said that when Luff arrived at the court of the Tuatha de Dan An, the gods of Ireland, he asked for a place among them. But they challenged him, asking what skill he could offer that they did not already possess. Luff, undeterred, listed his talents. He was a warrior, a smith, a poet, a harpist, a healer, and a craftsman. Yet, it wasn't until he revealed that he mastered all of these arts that the gods welcomed him. He wasn't just good at one thing. He was a master of everything, the very definition of what it meant to be truly gifted. This mastery was not born of arrogance, but of dedication, a tireless pursuit of knowledge and perfection. Luff was not content to merely exist, he sought to thrive, to push the boundaries of what was possible. His gifts were not just for himself, but for the people who looked to him for guidance, for inspiration. Every invention, every lesson, every victory in battle was a testament to the power of skill, the kind of skill that comes from giving your whole self to something. From pouring your heart into your craft until it becomes something more than just work, it becomes a legacy. Luffa's connection to the Harvest Festival, Lugna said, was rooted in this very idea of mastery and dedication. 
the festival, which takes place in late summer, was a time of both celebration and reflection, a time to give thanks for the bounty of the earth, but also to recognize the hard work and skill that went into the harvest. It was not enough to simply plant the seeds and wait for them to grow. The farmers and workers had to care for the land, nurture it, protect it from harm. And when the time came to reap the rewards of their labor, they honored Luff, the god who embodied the spirit of mastery and hard work. Lugnasad was not just a festival of food and drink, it was a festival of the human spirit, a recognition that through skill, dedication, and effort, anything was possible. In the grain that filled their hands, in the bread that nourished their bodies, the people saw Luffa's blessing. He was the light that guided them through the long days of labor, the inspiration that kept them going when the work was hard, and the reward that came when the harvest was plentiful. Luffa's light was not just the physical light of the sun, but the inner light that burned within each person. He was the spark of creativity, the drive to master a skill, the desire to be the best version of oneself. To honor Luff was to honor the part of ourselves that strives for greatness, that refuses to settle for mediocrity. His story was a reminder that we are all capable of more than we think, that within us lies the potential for brilliance if only we have the courage to pursue it. In battle, Luffa's spear was said to be unstoppable, a weapon forged with such skill that no enemy could stand against it. But his true power was not just in his weapon, but in his mind, his ability to think strategically, to see the bigger picture. He wasn't just a warrior, he was a leader, a teacher, someone who understood that true mastery comes not just from physical strength, but from wisdom, from the ability to understand and adapt. His victories were not just won on the battlefield, but in the hearts and minds of those who followed him. Luffa's connection to both the earth and the sky, to the practical and the divine, made him a unique figure in Celtic mythology. He was the god who could wield both a hammer and a harp, who could fight with both sword and song. His gifts were not confined to one domain, but spread across all aspects of life. He was a reminder that true mastery is not about specializing in one thing, but about understanding the interconnectedness of all things, about finding the light in every corner of life. Even today, the spirit of Luff lives on in those who strive to master their craft, and the artists who pour their souls into their work, and the healers who dedicate their lives to caring for others and the workers who labor day after day to bring food to the table. He is the light that burns within all of us, the voice that tells us to keep going, to keep pushing, to never give up on our dreams. He is the embodiment of excellence, a shining example of what it means to live a life of purpose and dedication. In every sunrise, in every act of creation, in every moment of hard work, Luffa's presence can be felt. He is the light that guides us, the inspiration that drives us, the skill that we strive for. And just as the people of old look to him for guidance and strength, so too can we find in him the motivation to keep moving forward, to keep working toward our own mastery, to honor the light that shines within us all. The night was still, the moon hung low in the sky, casting an eerie glow over the quiet landscape. It was in this silence, broken only by the soft rustling of leaves and the distant hoot of an owl, that the banshee made her presence known. Her wail, a haunting cry that echoed through the darkness, was more than just a sound, it was a forewarning, a chilling announcement that death was near. The banshee, with her mournful cry, is one of the most feared and sorrowful figures in Celtic folklore. She is not just a ghost or a spirit, she is a harbinger of death, a messenger from the other side. Her appearance is as ghostly as her wail is chilling. Often depicted as a pale woman with long, disheveled hair, her eyes are filled with the sadness of a thousand lost souls. In some tales, she wears a tattered cloak or a dress of mourning, a visual representation of the grief she carries with her. The wail of the banshee is not just a sound, but a profound expression of sorrow. It is said that her cry can pierce the night air, carrying with it a sense of impending doom. For those who hear it, the wail is a stark warning that someone they know is about to pass away. It is a sound that chills the bones, a reminder of the fragility of life and the inevitability of death. The origins of the banshee are as mysterious as her presence. She is believed to be a spirit connected to the ancient Celtic belief in the other world, a place where souls go after death. Some legends suggest she is a fairy or a goddess who has taken on the role of death's messenger. 
Others believe she is the spirit of a woman who has died a violent or tragic death and now roams the earth, bound by her sorrow and duty. Despite the fear she inspires, the Banshee is not a figure of malevolence. Her role is not to cause death, but to announce it, to prepare those left behind for the inevitable. Her cry, though terrifying, is a mark of respect for the deceased and a warning for the living. In many ways, she embodies the sadness of losing someone dear and the solemnity of the journey to the afterlife. The Banshee's significance in Celtic lore goes beyond just her role as a harbinger of death. She represents the deep connection between the living and the dead, a reminder that life and death are intertwined. Her cries serve as a bridge between the two worlds, a signal that the boundary between life and death is thin and ever-present. She is a symbol of the continuity of existence, a reminder that death is not an end, but a transition to another state of being. The appearance of the Banshee is often described with great detail in Celtic stories. Some say she has a face twisted in anguish, her eyes streaming with tears that seem to reflect the pain of countless souls. Her hair, wild and unkempt, adds to her ghostly appearance, a sign of her eternal mourning. In some accounts, she is seen as an old woman, her age reflecting the wisdom and sorrow she has accumulated over the ages. In others, she appears as a young maiden, her beauty a stark contrast to the sadness she brings. Her cry is said to be unmistakable. It is not a soft whimper, but a loud, piercing wail that can be heard from miles away. It carries with it the weight of impending loss, a sound that can freeze the blood and bring tears to the eyes. To hear the Banshee's wail is to know that death is near, a grim reminder that life is fleeting and precious. Despite the fear that surrounds the Banshee, her presence is also a form of comfort. For those who believe in her, her wail is a sign that the deceased will be greeted by someone who understands their sorrow. It is a signal that the journey to the afterlife is not one taken alone, but with someone who has walked that path before. The Banshee's role is to ensure that the transition is marked with respect and acknowledgement. In some stories, the Banshee is connected to specific families or lineages, her cries tied to the fate of those she watches over. In these tales, she is seen not just as a general harbinger of death, but as a personal messenger, her wail a direct warning to those who are linked to her through blood or bond. Her presence in these stories adds a layer of personal connection to the concept of death, making her role both intimate and universal. The Banshee's wail is a powerful symbol in Celtic folklore, representing the inevitability of death and the sorrow that accompanies it. Her cries are a reminder of the thin line between life and death, a bridge that connects the two realms. Though she brings fear, she also brings a sense of continuity, a reminder that death is not an end, but a part of the greater cycle of existence. In the end, the Banshee is a figure who embodies the deep, often painful connection between the living and the dead. Her wail, while chilling, is a part of the cycle of life and death, a sound that signifies respect for the passing of a soul and a reminder to cherish every moment of life. Her presence is a poignant reminder of the fragility of existence and the enduring link between those who have gone before and those who remain. In the misty shores of the far northern seas, where the waves crash against rocky cliffs and the sea breeze carries whispers of ancient tales, lives the Selkie, a being of both seal and human. Drifting between worlds with a grace that is as haunting as it is beautiful. The Selkies are not just creatures of legend, but symbols of love, loss, and the ever-changing nature of identity. Selkies possess a remarkable gift. They can transform from seals into humans, shedding their seal skins to walk on land. Their seal forms are sleek and graceful, gliding through the water with ease, while their human forms are strikingly beautiful, enchanting anyone who encounters them. The transformation is seamless, a fluid shift that seems almost magical, reflecting a deep connection to both the sea and the land. The tales of Selkies are filled with a poignant sense of longing and heartache. One of the most enduring stories is of a Selkie who, while on land, meets and falls in love with a human. They marry, build a life together, and perhaps have children. But the happiness is always tinged with sorrow, for the Selkie's true nature is never far from their mind. The moment the Selkie seal skin is found or taken, the connection to the sea becomes irresistible, and they must return to the ocean, leaving behind their human life and loved ones. 
This transformation is not just a physical change, but an emotional and spiritual shift as well. When a silky leaves their human life, it's as though a part of them is being pulled back to the depths of the ocean, to a place that is both home and a symbol of something lost. The separation is often depicted as a deep, soul-wrenching sorrow, an echo of a love that could not fully bridge the gap between sea and land. In many stories, the silky's return to the sea is marked by a sense of inevitability. The seal skin, once found, cannot be ignored. It calls to the silky with a power that transcends mere attraction. It is a pull towards their true self, their true home. The human life, no matter how cherished, cannot compete with the primal bond to the ocean. And so, with a heavy heart, the silky must leave behind everything they've known, slipping back into the sea, leaving a void that cannot be filled. The tales of silkies are rich with emotion and offer a glimpse into the struggle between the desire for belonging and the pull of one's true nature. The stories often highlight the bittersweet nature of their existence, a life lived between two worlds, always yearning for something just out of reach. The love they leave behind is real, deep, and filled with memories that linger like a haunting melody, a reminder of the life they once had and the heartache of leaving it behind. In some tales, the Silky's departure is not just a personal loss, but a shared grief. The human partners, left behind, are often depicted as living with a lingering sense of sadness, a recognition of the beauty and pain of the love they once shared. They may wait by the shore, hoping for a glimpse of the Silky returning, or they may carry on with their lives, forever marked by the fleeting time they spent with someone who was, by nature, always destined to leave. These stories also reflect a deeper, more universal theme, the tension between the desire for connection and the need for authenticity. The Selkie's ability to transform symbolizes the duality of existence, the balance between the parts of ourselves that long for one thing and the parts that are inherently tied to something else. Their tales are a reflection on what it means to be true to oneself, even when that truth leads to pain and separation. In many ways, the Silkies remind us of the fragile beauty of love and the inevitable changes that come with life. Their stories resonate with anyone who has experienced the bittersweet nature of love, the joy of connection tempered by the pain of parting. They speak to the heart of human experience, where the longing for something more is always balanced by the reality of what we must leave behind. The legends of Silkies also evoke a sense of mystery and wonder about the natural world. The sea, with its vast, mysterious depths, is a place of beauty and danger, a symbol of both life and loss. The silkies, moving effortlessly between the sea and land, embody the fluidity of existence, the idea that we are all part of something greater, something both beautiful and elusive. The stories of silkies, with their haunting wails and emotional depth, are a testament to the power of myth to capture the complexities of human emotions. They remind us that love is not always easy, that it can come with a cost, and that sometimes, even the most beautiful connections are fleeting. Through the Silkies, we see a reflection of our own struggles, our own desires, and our own capacity for love and loss. On moonlit nights, when the fog rolls in and the world feels like a whisper away from the ordinary, the puka comes alive. This enigmatic creature, known for its mischievous and unpredictable nature, roams the countryside in a variety of forms, each more bewildering than the last. The Puka is a shapeshifter, a master of disguise with a knack for causing chaos and confusion wherever it goes. The Puka's ability to transform is both fascinating and frightening. It can take on the guise of anything from a sleek horse to a shaggy goat, a cunning fox, or even a fearsome giant. Each form is chosen not just for its appearance, but for its ability to unsettle and surprise. When it appears as a horse, it may entice unsuspecting riders to mount, only to gallop off into the night, leaving them lost and bewildered. In its fox form, it might dart around the edges of a field, playing tricks and leading travelers astray. The unpredictability of the puka is what makes it truly unsettling. Unlike other creatures of folklore, which often have clear motives or patterns, the puka seems to revel in chaos for its own sake. Its tricks are not always malicious, but they are always disorienting. It might lead someone to a hidden treasure or an enchanted glen, only to vanish when they least expect it, leaving them with nothing but confusion and a story that sounds too wild to be believed. Yet, 
Beneath the surface of its antics lies a deeper, more poignant truth. The puka, in all its trickery, reflects the uncertainty of life itself. It reminds us that the world is full of surprises, both delightful and disturbing. Its antics, though often frustrating, are a reminder that not everything can be controlled or understood. Sometimes, the best we can do is adapt to the unexpected and find our way through the chaos. The puka's tricks to nature is also a reflection of the duality of existence. It embodies the idea that joy and sorrow, clarity and confusion, are intertwined. Its playful antics can lead to moments of laughter and delight, but they can also bring a sense of vulnerability and fear. The creature's ability to shift shapes and blur boundaries serves as a metaphor for the fluid nature of reality, where things are not always what they seem and where certainty is often elusive. The tales of the puka are filled with a mix of fear and fascination. People who have encountered it speak of the unsettling experience of seeing a familiar place transformed into something strange and unfamiliar. The puka might turn a well-known path into a labyrinth or make a friendly face seem threatening. These stories capture the essence of its nature, a being that thrives on shaking up the mundane and forcing people to confront the unknown. One story tells of a farmer who, after a long day of work, came across a beautiful white horse grazing in his field. Eager to show off his find, he mounted the horse and began a leisurely ride. But as the moon rose higher in the sky, the horse grew increasingly wild, galloping faster and faster until the farmer was thrown from its back. When he looked around, the horse had vanished, and he found himself miles from home, exhausted and disoriented. The encounter left him with a profound sense of awe and a reminder of the unpredictable nature of the world. In another tale, a young girl was lured into the woods by the sound of laughter and music. She followed the sounds, believing them to be the source of great joy. Instead, she stumbled upon a gathering of strange beings who danced and sang in a language she couldn't understand. When she tried to join in, the music stopped and the beings vanished, leaving her alone in the dark woods. The experience was both enchanting and terrifying, a reminder of the fine line between wonder and danger. The puka's role as a shapeshifter and trickster also touches on themes of identity and transformation. It challenges our understanding of what is real and what is illusion. By shifting forms and playing tricks, it forces us to question our assumptions and to see the world in new and unexpected ways. The creature embodies the idea that identity is not fixed but fluid, and that the boundaries between self and other, reality and fantasy, are often more porous than we might like to believe. Despite its reputation for causing trouble, the puka is not purely malevolent. Its tricks are often seen as a form of play, a way of reminding people to stay alert and flexible. It teaches the value of humor and resilience in the face of the unknown. The puka's antics, while unsettling, also offer a chance to laugh at the absurdities of life and to find joy in the midst of uncertainty. In the end, the puka is a reminder of the magic that exists in the world, hidden in plain sight. Its shape-shifting and trickery may be unsettling, but they also serve as a testament to the richness and complexity of life. Through its antics, the puka invites us to embrace the unexpected, to find beauty in the unpredictable, and to recognize that even in moments of confusion, there is always a spark of wonder waiting to be discovered. In ancient woodlands and along the edges of forgotten temples, a figure emerges from the natural world, entwined with leaves and vines, a living embodiment of the Earth's eternal cycle. This figure is the Green Man, a symbol both timeless and profoundly moving, representing the spirit of nature, renewal, and the shifting seasons. The Green Man is not merely a carved face or a fleeting image, he is a reminder of nature's power and its connection to human life. Often depicted with a face framed by leaves and foliage, he seems to breathe life into the very forest around him. His eyes, sometimes appearing wise and serene, sometimes wild and untamed, reflect the ever-changing moods of the natural world. His mouth, obscured by a tangle of vines, hints at the secrets and stories held by the earth. The green man's presence speaks of the cycle of life, death, and rebirth that governs nature. Each leaf that sprouts and withers is a testament to his role in the endless dance of the seasons. 
In spring, when new growth breaks through the soil, the green man's face seems to smile with the promise of fresh beginnings. In summer, as the land flourishes under the warmth of the sun, he embodies the fullness and vitality of life. By autumn, when leaves turn gold and fall, he reflects on the quiet wisdom of change, accepting the necessity of letting go. And in winter, as the land rests beneath a blanket of snow, he is a reminder of nature's endurance, preparing for the rebirth that will come with the new year. The green man's symbolism is deeply rooted in the Celtic reverence for the land. To the Celts, nature was a living entity, imbued with spirit and sacredness. The green man represents the land's ability to regenerate and the sacred bond between humans and nature. He stands as a guardian of the earth's rhythms, a reminder that human life is intertwined with the cycles of the natural world. Legends tell of the green man appearing in times of great change or crisis, offering guidance and reassurance. His presence is said to bring a sense of peace and continuity, reminding people that even in the darkest times, life continues to grow and evolve. His face, hidden among the foliage, whispers of ancient wisdom, urging us to remember our connection to the earth and to honor its rhythms. The stories surrounding the green man often reflect a deep respect for the land and its cycles. One tale tells of a community that, after a harsh winter, feared the land would never recover. But as they gathered to celebrate the coming of spring, they noticed the green man's face appearing in the trees, smiling with the promise of new life. The sight brought hope and renewed faith in the land's ability to heal and regenerate. Another story speaks of a traveler who, lost in a dense forest, encountered the green man's face carved into an ancient oak. As night fell and shadows grew long, the traveler felt a sense of calm wash over them. The green man's eyes seemed to guide them, leading them to safety. The experience left them with a profound appreciation for nature's ability to offer both guidance and comfort. The green man's connection to the earth also highlights the importance of respecting and nurturing the land. His presence is a call to recognize the beauty and value of nature, to cherish and protect it as a source of life and renewal. In honoring the green man, people honor the cycles of nature and the interconnectedness of all living things. Through the green man, we are reminded of the deep bond between humanity and the natural world. His face, woven from leaves and vines, is a testament to the earth's enduring strength and beauty. He invites us to reflect on the cycles of our own lives, to find solace in the rhythms of change, and to celebrate the renewal that comes with each season. The green man is not just a symbol of nature, he is a living, breathing reminder of the profound connection we share with the world around us. In ancient stone carvings and intricate jewelry, a symbol spins through the ages, weaving a tale of eternity and interconnectedness. The triskeel, or triple spiral, stands as one of the most enduring symbols of Celtic heritage, capturing the essence of life's perpetual cycles and the seamless flow of existence. At first glance, the triskeel might seem like a simple pattern, three spirals, each one swirling out from a common center, their paths gracefully intertwining. Yet, this symbol holds within it a depth of meaning that reaches far beyond its elegant design. It represents a vision of the world where everything is connected, moving in a continuous dance of birth, life, and renewal. The triskeel spirals are not static, they move in a perpetual motion that suggests the ever-changing yet constant nature of the universe. The symbol's swirling lines seem to flow into one another, creating a sense of movement that mirrors the cycles of nature. Just as the spirals blend seamlessly, so too do the phases of life blend into one another, each phase feeding into the next, each ending a prelude to a new beginning. One of the most poignant aspects of the triskeel is its reflection of the cycles of life and nature. The symbol can represent the passage of time, the changing seasons, or the stages of human life. In spring, life bursts forth with new growth. In summer, it reaches its peak. In autumn, it begins to wane and in winter, it rests, preparing for renewal. This cycle is not just a series of stages, but a continuous loop, with each part inherently connected to the others. The triskeel also speaks to the idea of interconnectedness. The three spirals, while distinct in their path, are bound together at the center. This unity at the heart of the symbol represents the idea that everything in life is linked, each action, each thought, each moment is part of a larger whole. 
The symbol serves as a reminder that our lives, though seemingly separate and individual, are intricately woven into the fabric of existence. The connections we make and the actions we take ripple through the world, affecting everything around us in ways both seen and unseen. This sense of unity and connection extends to the spiritual realm as well. The triskeel is often associated with the divine, representing the sacred triads that are central to Celtic spirituality. It can symbolize the tripartite nature of deities, the interplay of life forces, or the harmony between body, mind, and spirit. Each spiral of the triskeel can be seen as a reflection of these sacred aspects, coming together to form a complete and balanced whole. In Celtic traditions, the triskeel is more than just a symbol, it is a visual expression of deep philosophical and spiritual truths. It embodies the belief that life is an endless cycle, that endings are simply the start of something new, and that all things are interrelated. The symbol encourages a perspective that sees beyond the surface of things, recognizing the deeper connections that bind us all together. Stories and legends often depict the triskeel as a guiding emblem, offering comfort and insight. One tale speaks of a wise elder who wore a triskeel pendant as a reminder of life's eternal flow. During times of struggle and change, the elder would gaze upon the symbol, finding solace in its assurance that every hardship would lead to renewal, and every ending would bring about a new beginning. Another story tells of a community that, during a harsh winter, found hope in the triskeel carved into their ancient stone circle. The spirals reminded them that the cold and darkness were merely temporary phases, and that the warmth and light of spring would inevitably return. The symbol became a beacon of hope, a reminder that the cycles of nature would continue and that life's rhythms would restore balance and harmony. The triskeel's beauty lies in its simplicity and its profound depth. Its spirals, ever in motion, capture the essence of life's continuous dance, reminding us of the interconnectedness of all things. As we navigate our own paths through life, the triskeel invites us to recognize the beauty in change, the strength in unity, and the hope that lies in the cycles of existence. Its presence in our lives serves as a comforting reminder that, no matter how tumultuous the journey, we are always part of a larger, harmonious whole, moving together in the eternal dance of life. Every time your eyes drift across a Celtic knot, you might find yourself mesmerized by its endless loops and intricate patterns. These ancient designs, with their never-ending twists and turns, capture something profound about the nature of life and the universe. The Celtic knot, with its seamless interweaving lines, speaks of eternity, unity, and the continuous flow of time and existence. The Celtic knot is not just a beautiful design, it's a symbol that wraps around the concept of infinity. Its patterns, with no beginning and no end, reflect the idea that some things in life are eternal and unbreakable. Just as the lines of the knot intertwine endlessly, so too does the cycle of life and death, creation and renewal, continue without interruption. The unbroken lines signify that life flows on, despite the challenges and changes we face. What makes the Celtic knot truly special is its depiction of interconnectedness. Each line that forms the knot is linked to every other line, creating a unified whole. This symbolizes how all aspects of life and existence are connected. The twists and turns of the knot remind us that every action we take, every choice we make, affects everything else around us. This intricate pattern mirrors the way our lives are intertwined with the lives of others and with the world itself. In the world of Celtic symbolism, the knot also represents spiritual growth. The endless loops signify the journey of the soul, ever-expanding and evolving. Just as the lines of the knot weave together to form a cohesive design, so do our experiences, struggles, and triumphs come together to shape our spiritual path. The knot serves as a reminder that our growth is a continuous process shaped by the interconnected experiences of our lives. There's a profound beauty in the way Celtic knots incorporate both complexity and simplicity. On the surface, they appear as intricate designs, yet they convey a deep, universal truth. Their endless loops and interwoven lines tell a story of unity and wholeness. When you gaze at a Celtic knot, you see a reflection of the endless cycle of life, the connection between all things, and the spiritual journey we undertake. In ancient times, Celtic knots were often used in art and decoration, appearing on everything from stone carvings to manuscripts. 
They were not merely ornamental, they held significant spiritual and cultural meaning. For the Celts, these knots were a way of expressing their beliefs about the universe and their place within it. The pattern symbolized the divine order of the cosmos and the sacred connections that bind all life together. One touching story from Celtic tradition describes a wise elder who wore a pendant featuring a Celtic knot. The elder would often tell tales of the knot's meaning, explaining how its unending loops represented the eternal nature of the soul and the unity of all living things. The pendant served as a constant reminder of the interconnectedness of life, inspiring those around the elder to live in harmony and balance. In another story, a community facing a time of great hardship found solace in the intricate patterns of a Celtic knot carved into their ancient stones. The symbol offered a sense of continuity and hope, reassuring them that their struggles were part of a larger, interconnected story. The knot's endless loops became a beacon of resilience, reminding them that even in the darkest times, the cycles of life would continue, and they would find their way through. The Celtic knot's ability to convey such profound meanings through its simple design is a testament to its enduring power. Its patterns, though intricate, capture a universal truth about the nature of existence, one that resonates deeply with anyone who contemplates its beauty. The knot symbolizes the eternal flow of life, the unity of all things, and the spiritual journey that binds us all together. As you trace the lines of a Celtic knot, let yourself be drawn into its endless loop. Feel the connection to the past, present, and future that it represents. Recognize the ways in which your own life is intertwined with the lives of others, and find comfort in the knowledge that you are part of a larger, unbroken whole. The Celtic knot, with its intricate patterns and timeless symbolism, serves as a reminder of the profound unity and infinite continuity that define our existence. The Clodagh symbol, with its simple yet profound design, has touched hearts for generations, embodying the essence of love, loyalty, and friendship. At first glance, it may seem like just a ring, but its story runs much deeper, reflecting the core values that unite people across time and distance. The Clodagh symbol consists of two hands holding a heart, topped with a crown. This straightforward image carries with it a powerful message. The hands represent friendship, the heart stands for love, and the crown symbolizes loyalty. Together, they form a perfect harmony of these cherished values, speaking to the heart in a way that words often cannot. The Clodagh's significance goes beyond its charming appearance. Originating from the small village of Clodagh in Ireland, it was more than just a piece of jewelry. It became a tradition, a way to convey deep emotions and connections that transcend mere words. The symbol was often passed down through generations, making each piece not just a personal token, but a family heirloom, rich with stories and memories. Wearing a Clodagh ring can be a deeply personal choice, imbued with meaning that reflects the wearer's status and intentions. Traditionally, the way the ring is worn can signal different stages of one's relationship status. If worn on the right hand with the heart facing outwards, it means the wearer is open to love. When turned inward, it signifies that the wearer is in a committed relationship. Wearing it on the left hand with the heart facing inward denotes engagement or marriage. This tradition highlights how the Clodagh is not just a symbol of static values, but an emblem of evolving personal relationships. One of the most touching stories related to the Clodagh symbol is the tale of Richard Joyce, who was believed to have crafted the first Clodagh ring. Joyce was a young man from Clodagh who was captured by pirates and sold into slavery. During his captivity, he crafted a Clodagh ring with the hope of one day giving it to his beloved. After many years, Joyce was finally freed and returned home, where he presented the ring to his true love, symbolizing his undying affection and loyalty. This story beautifully illustrates the symbol's association with enduring love and steadfast commitment, no matter the obstacles. The Clodagh also resonates deeply with those who value friendship. The intertwined hands in the design represent the bond between friends, a connection built on trust and mutual support. Many people choose to give Clodagh rings to their closest friends as a token of their enduring friendship, cherishing the way the symbol embodies their shared history and loyalty. In the cultural context, the Clodagh symbol is more than just an ornament, it is a celebration of relationships that withstand the test of time. 
It reflects the belief that love, friendship, and loyalty are not fleeting but enduring values that can weather any storm. Whether given as a gift, worn as a personal statement, or passed down through generations, the Clodagh represents a heartfelt commitment to these timeless ideals. Imagine the countless hands that have worn this symbol, each one telling a story of love and friendship that transcends generations. The Clodagh's simple design captures the depth of human emotion and connection, reminding us that the values of love, loyalty, and friendship are universal and timeless. Each time you see this symbol, you witness the silent promise of these virtues, a promise that has been cherished and honored for centuries. Standing tall and proud, the oak tree commands respect and awe with its majestic presence. In the ancient Celtic world, the oak was more than just a tree. It was a revered symbol of strength, endurance, and wisdom. Its broad branches and sturdy trunk made it a natural emblem of power and stability, deeply woven into the spiritual fabric of Celtic life. When you stand beneath an oak tree, you feel a sense of awe as you look up at its towering canopy. The oak's strength is evident in its solid trunk and expansive limbs, which have weathered countless storms and stood through the test of time. This resilience is why the oak became a powerful symbol of endurance for the Celts. To them, it was not just a tree but a living embodiment of the unwavering strength that guided and protected their communities. The oak's deep roots, which anchor it firmly into the earth, speak of a profound connection to the land. This connection was particularly significant in Celtic spirituality, where the natural world was seen as a reflection of the divine. The oak's roots represent stability and groundedness, qualities that were highly valued in a world where survival often depended on one's ability to withstand adversity. By honoring the oak, the Celts honored their own resilience and the strength needed to face life's challenges. Its branches, spreading wide and high, symbolize wisdom. The ancient Celts believed that the oak was a gateway to the divine, its branches reaching up to the heavens while its roots dug deep into the earth. This connection between sky and soil made the oak a bridge between the mortal and the spiritual worlds. Druids, the wise priests of the Celts, often performed their rituals in oak groves, believing that the tree's presence helped them access higher wisdom and insight. The oak's ability to stand strong through the ages was seen as a reflection of its spiritual wisdom, offering guidance and clarity to those who sought it. The oak tree also held a sacred place in Celtic rituals and ceremonies. Its wood was used to build sacred altars and temples, and its leaves were woven into garlands for ceremonies. The Celts believed that by honoring the oak, they were connecting with the powerful energies of nature and the divine. The presence of the oak in these sacred spaces was a constant reminder of the strength and wisdom that guided their lives and their spiritual practices. The oak tree's significance extended beyond the spiritual realm into the everyday lives of the Celts. It provided essential resources, from timber for building homes and boats to acorns for food. The oak was not just a symbol of strength and wisdom, but also a practical source of sustenance and support. Its ability to provide for the people, while standing strong and resilient, mirrored the qualities that the Celts aspired to embody in their own lives. One moving story from Celtic tradition tells of a small village that faced a devastating drought. The villagers, feeling desperate, turned to the sacred oak at the heart of their community. They gathered around the tree, offering prayers and rituals to invoke its strength and wisdom. As they completed their ceremonies, rain began to fall, renewing their land and their hope. The oak, steadfast and enduring, had become a source of comfort and renewal, illustrating the profound bond between the people and their sacred tree. In another tale, an old druid, wise and revered, would often sit beneath the oak, sharing his wisdom with those who came to seek guidance. The tree, with its vast branches and deep roots, was his constant companion and source of inspiration. The villagers came to understand that the oak was not just a symbol, but a living presence that connected them to their heritage, their land, and their spiritual beliefs. The oak tree's enduring presence in Celtic culture reflects a deep respect for nature's power and mystery. Its strength, wisdom, and connection to the divine made it a central figure in the spiritual and practical lives of the Celts. As you stand beneath the ancient branches of an oak tree, you are reminded of the timeless qualities that it represents, strength to endure, wisdom to guide, and a deep connection to the world around you. 
The oak, with its silent grace, continues to inspire and touch hearts, embodying the very essence of endurance and wisdom that defines the Celtic spirit. The salmon of knowledge glides through the still waters of Celtic folklore, a figure wrapped in mystery and wisdom. Imagine a fish so wise that it holds the secrets of the universe within its scales. This isn't just a fairy tale, it's a powerful symbol that has touched the hearts of many, embodying the deep human quest for understanding and enlightenment. In ancient Celtic stories, the salmon of knowledge is a creature of immense significance, representing the ultimate pursuit of wisdom. According to legend, this salmon swims in the well of wisdom, a magical spring from which all knowledge flows. Its flesh is imbued with the power to bestow profound insight upon anyone who consumes it, turning ordinary seekers into enlightened beings. The story often begins with the heroic figure of Finn Mac Cumhail, a legendary warrior and leader in Celtic mythology. As the tale goes, Finn was just a boy when he first encountered the Salmon of Knowledge. Under the guidance of his wise mentor, the poet and seer Finegas, Finn learned of the Salmon's special role. Fine gas had devoted years to catching the elusive fish, dreaming of acquiring the wisdom it contained. The knowledge that the salmon held was so powerful that it was said to be capable of answering any question, solving any riddle, and revealing the deepest truths of existence. One fateful day, Fine gas finally caught the salmon of knowledge. He was overjoyed, believing that the wisdom it held would soon be his. But the universe had other plans. As he prepared to cook the salmon, Fine Gas accidentally burned his finger on the hot fat. Without thinking, he put his finger in his mouth, tasting the essence of the fish. Immediately, he was overwhelmed by a flood of profound insights and realizations. He had gained the wisdom of the salmon, but at a price, he could no longer claim it as his alone. The story takes a dramatic turn when Finn, still a young boy, is summoned to assist Fine Gas. Unaware of the significance of the salmon, Finn was entrusted with the task of cooking it. As he cooked, he tasted the fish's essence when he burned his own thumb. To his surprise, the moment he tasted the fat, he was filled with an extraordinary surge of knowledge. Finn's senses were heightened, his mind sharpened, and his understanding deepened in a way that was both awe-inspiring and overwhelming. From that day on, Finn possessed the wisdom of the salmon, a gift that would shape his destiny and guide him through many adventures. His newfound insight was not merely intellectual, it was a profound, almost spiritual awakening that connected him to the world in ways he had never imagined. He could see beyond the surface of things, understanding the hidden truths that lay beneath the ordinary. The salmon of knowledge embodies more than just the quest for intellectual enlightenment. It symbolizes the journey each of us undertakes to find deeper meaning in life. Just as the salmon swims against the current to reach the well of wisdom, so too do we struggle and strive to gain understanding and insight. The tale of the salmon of knowledge resonates with those who seek truth and wisdom, reminding us that the path to enlightenment often requires perseverance and sacrifice. The salmon of knowledge also highlights the theme of shared wisdom. While Fine Gas was initially the one seeking the fish's wisdom, it was Finn who ultimately received the gift. This shift in destiny suggests that wisdom is not a possession to be held tightly, but a treasure to be shared and passed on. The knowledge bestowed by the salmon was meant to benefit not just one person, but all who could be touched by it. In Celtic lore, the salmon of knowledge represents a powerful connection between the physical world and the spiritual realm. The fish, living in the magical well, serves as a bridge between these worlds, embodying the idea that true wisdom lies beyond the everyday and is accessible only through a deep, almost mystical connection with the universe. As you ponder the story of the Salmon of Knowledge, you feel the weight of its significance. It's not just a tale of magical fish and wise warriors, it's a reflection of our own desires to understand the world and ourselves. The salmon's journey, and the wisdom it imparts, speaks to the heart's deepest longings and the soul's quest for truth. Each ripple in the water carries a whisper of ancient knowledge, reminding us that the pursuit of wisdom is a journey worth taking, no matter where it leads. When the first notes of a harp's melody drift through the air, something magical happens. The sound, delicate yet powerful, weaves its way into the heart and soul, carrying with it a profound sense of identity and belonging. The Celtic harp is more than an instrument, 
It is a symbol of music and artistry that embodies the very essence of Celtic culture. In the ancient Celtic world, the harp was not just an object of beauty, but a vessel of deep emotion and national pride. Its strings sang the stories of the people, capturing their joys, sorrows, and dreams in every note. The harp's music was the heartbeat of Celtic tradition, a sound that resonated through the hills and valleys, echoing the rhythm of the land and the spirit of its people. The Celtic harp, with its elegant curves and resonant strings, is deeply embedded in the cultural heritage of the Celts. It was more than just a musical instrument, it was a symbol of artistic excellence and a marker of cultural identity. The melodies played on this harp were said to be imbued with magical qualities, capable of touching the deepest corners of the human soul. When a harp is played, they were not just creating music, they were weaving a tapestry of emotion, history, and tradition. Each note played on the harp carried the weight of generations past. The melodies were often used to tell tales of ancient heroes, epic battles, and the beauty of the land. These stories were passed down through the harp strings, each pluck and strum a reminder of the rich tapestry of Celtic lore. The harpists, or bards, were revered not just for their skill, but for their ability to connect people to their heritage through music. In Celtic tradition, the harp was also a symbol of power and influence. The ability to play the harp well was a mark of high status, and skilled harpists were often held in great esteem. They were seen as custodians of knowledge and tradition, their music a bridge between the past and the present. The harp strings were thought to hold the very essence of the land and its people, making it a powerful emblem of cultural unity. One of the most touching aspects of the Celtic harp is its role in marking significant moments in life. From celebrations and ceremonies to times of mourning, the harp's music was a constant presence, providing comfort and connection. The soft, haunting melodies played during moments of sorrow helped to soothe the grieving, while joyful tunes at festivals and weddings brought people together in celebration. The harp was a companion through the highs and lows of life, its music a constant thread in the fabric of Celtic existence. The harp's importance is reflected in its presence in Celtic art and symbolism. Depictions of the harp can be found on ancient stones and artifacts, highlighting its central role in Celtic culture. The harp often appears alongside symbols of power and unity, underscoring its significance as a marker of identity and pride. It is not just a musical instrument, but a cultural icon, representing the heart of the Celtic people and their rich heritage. As you listen to the gentle strains of a Celtic harp, you can almost feel the history and emotion embedded in each note. The harp's music has the power to transport you to another time, to a place where the stories of the past come alive through melody. It carries with it a sense of continuity and connection, linking the present with the ancient traditions of the Celts. The harp's ability to evoke such deep feelings is a testament to its enduring significance. It is a symbol of more than just music, it represents the soul of Celtic culture, a reminder of the beauty and strength that lies within. When the harp strings are plucked, it is as if the very spirit of the Celts is being expressed, their stories and emotions woven into the music that transcends time and place. The Celtic harp, with its rich history and emotional depth, stands as a powerful symbol of music and identity. Its melodies continue to resonate with those who seek to connect with the past, offering a touch of the magic and wonder that defined the Celtic world. The sound of the harp is a reminder of the enduring power of music to capture the essence of who we are and to celebrate the heritage that shapes us. A chilling breeze sweeps through the night as the sound of hooves pounds against the earth, echoing in the silence like a grim reminder of what lies beyond. The Dullahan rides through the dark, an eerie silhouette against the moonlit sky. This spectral figure, the Headless Horseman, is a haunting presence in Celtic folklore, embodying the eerie edge of the supernatural. The Dullahan is not merely a ghostly rider, he is a grim reaper of sorts, a harbinger of death who roams the land with a fearsome purpose. His appearance is enough to send shivers down anyone's spine. Clad in dark, tattered robes and mounted on a fearsome black horse, he carries his own head under one arm. The head, ghastly and lifeless, serves as both a weapon and a symbol of his role as a bringer of doom. His eyes, though hollow, seem to see everything, and his gaze is enough to freeze the blood of anyone who meets it. 
Legends say that the Dullahan is drawn to the homes of those who are about to die. As he rides through the countryside, his presence is marked by a series of ominous signs. The sound of his horse's hooves is the first warning, followed by the clinking of chains or the distant cries of the damned. Those who hear these sounds know that death is near, and the Dullahan's visit is often followed by the passing of someone close. The headless horseman is said to ride with a terrifying speed and a sense of purpose. His journey is not one of random terror, but of inevitable fate. He rides without rest, driven by a relentless need to claim the souls destined to leave this world. His mere presence is enough to bring about an overwhelming sense of dread, a chilling reminder of the thin veil that separates life from death. In some tales, the Dullahan is accompanied by a headless coach and a team of ghostly horses. The coach is described as a dark, menacing vehicle that moves with a supernatural grace. Inside, it is said to be filled with the spirits of the recently deceased, a macabre parade that follows the Dullahan wherever he goes. The sound of the coach's wheels is another sign of his approach, a harbinger of the inevitable. The Dullahan's role in folklore serves as a stark reminder of the Celtic understanding of death and the supernatural. Unlike many other mythological figures, the Dullahan is not just a symbol of death, but an active agent in its execution. He is a figure of both terror and inevitability, representing the inescapable nature of fate. The headless rider's eerie presence is more than just a frightening tale. It embodies the ancient belief that death is not an end, but a transition, a journey to another realm. The Dullahan's relentless pursuit of souls reflects the idea that death is an active, powerful force, one that is always moving and always watching. His role as a bringer of death and a symbol of the supernatural underscores the deep-seated reverence and fear that the Celts held for the unknown. As the night falls and the sound of hooves fades into the distance, the Dullahan's presence lingers in the minds of those who have heard his tale. The Headless Horseman is a reminder of the power of folklore to evoke deep emotions, to bring to life the fears and mysteries that lie just beyond the reach of understanding. His story, while terrifying, also serves as a testament to the rich tapestry of Celtic mythology, a blend of horror and reverence that captures the essence of human fears and beliefs about the unknown. Under the ancient canopy of a Celtic forest, a mystical script lies hidden, etched into stones and wood. This script, known as Agam, whispers secrets of the past and the magic of the natural world. Each symbol in Agam is more than just a letter, it is a key to understanding the deep connection between the Celts and the trees that surrounded them. Agam is a script composed of lines and notches carved into wood, stone, or bone, each representing different letters and sounds. What makes Agam extraordinary is its profound link to nature. Each letter of the Agam alphabet is associated with a specific tree, a symbol of the ancient Celts' deep reverence for the natural world. This connection makes Agam not just a means of communication, but a living, breathing extension of nature's magic. Imagine walking through an ancient forest, where the trees are not just silent giants, but living symbols of wisdom and power. Each tree holds a letter of the Agam alphabet, and through its form, it conveys messages of the natural world. The birch tree, for example, represents the letter B, and is seen as a symbol of renewal and purification. The oak, associated with the letter D, stands as a pillar of strength and endurance, a guardian of ancient knowledge. The Agam script is more than just an alphabet, it is a bridge between the human world and the spiritual realm. To the Celts, these tree symbols were not merely letters but sacred entities with their own spirits and meanings. Carvings in Agam were believed to carry magical properties, used in rituals and spells to invoke the power of the trees and their associated spirits. Each symbol was a conduit for the energies of nature, capable of influencing both the physical and spiritual aspects of life. When an ancient Celt carved an Agam inscription into a stone or wood, they were not merely recording information. They were weaving a tapestry of magic, embedding their words with the essence of the trees. These inscriptions were often used in rituals, marking sacred spaces or invoking the protection and guidance of the tree spirits. The symbols held the power to connect with the divine and the natural forces that shaped their world. Imagine the sensation of touching an Agam-inscribed stone, feeling the rough texture of the carvings under your fingers. 
Each line and notch carries the weight of centuries, whispering tales of a time when the world was deeply intertwined with the natural order. The Agam script, with its roots in the earth, speaks of a wisdom that transcends time, a reminder of the ancient bond between humanity and the natural world. The Agam script also reflects the Celts' belief in the cyclical nature of life. Each tree symbol in the script is connected to a specific time of year, marking the changing seasons and the eternal cycles of life and death. This cyclical nature is mirrored in the script itself, with each letter representing a different aspect of the natural world and its rhythms. The Agam alphabet becomes a living calendar, a guide through the seasons, and a symbol of the endless dance between the spiritual and the earthly. The sacredness of Agam is not just in its use, but in its preservation. Carvings on ancient stones and monuments have survived the ravages of time, standing as silent witnesses to the enduring power of the Celts' connection to nature. These inscriptions are more than historical artifacts. They are living reminders of a world where every tree, every symbol, and every letter held a deeper meaning, a sacred link to the divine. As you ponder the ancient Agam script, you feel the weight of its history and the depth of its connection to the natural world. The symbols carved into wood and stone are more than mere letters. They are echoes of a time when the world was seen as a living tapestry, woven together by the magic of the trees and the wisdom of the ancients. Each symbol is a testament to the Celts' reverence for nature and their belief in the power of the written word to connect with the divine. In the quiet moments of dusk, when the sun dips below the horizon and shadows dance across the land, the echoes of ancient Celtic myths and symbols whisper through the ages. They tell stories of gods, spirits, and symbols that have transcended time, leaving their mark on our world today. The magic and mystery of the Celts, once vibrant in their own time, still weave through the fabric of modern culture, folklore, and spirituality. Feel the heartbeat of history in the intricate designs of Celtic knots that adorn jewelry, tattoos, and artwork. These loops and twists, seemingly endless, carry the essence of eternity and interconnectedness. Every twist represents a bond that cannot be broken, a reminder of how past and present are forever linked. The ancient Celts saw these patterns as reflections of the eternal cycles of life, and today, they continue to inspire a sense of continuity and unity. Think about the Clado Ring, with its heart, crown, and hands, symbolizing love, loyalty, and friendship. This emblem, born from Celtic tradition, finds its way into modern life, capturing the essence of connections that endure through time. Whether gifted between friends or lovers, the Clado remains a powerful symbol of commitment and affection, echoing the deep bonds cherished by the Celts. The haunting beauty of the Banshee, whose cries foretell death, still resonates in our stories and legends. Though the Banshee's wail might chill the spine, it also connects us to a deeper understanding of how we view death and the supernatural. Her presence in modern media and literature keeps alive the ancient fears and fascinations of Celtic folklore, showing how deeply these myths are embedded in our cultural psyche. Consider the legacy of the green man, whose face emerges from the leaves, symbolizing nature's eternal renewal. This figure, representing the cycle of growth, decay, and rebirth, appears in contemporary art and architecture, linking us to the timeless reverence for nature that the Celts held dear. As we look at the green man's visage peering through modern carvings and designs, we are reminded of our own connection to the natural world. The mystique of the Morrigan, goddess of war and fate, still finds a place in modern spirituality and storytelling. Her fierce, prophetic nature speaks to the complex interplay of destiny and choice, themes that continue to captivate our imaginations. The Morrigan's legacy challenges us to confront our own fears and aspirations, reflecting the enduring relevance of Celtic mythology in understanding our place in the world. The Salmon of Knowledge, with its association with wisdom and insight, transcends its mythical origins to inspire the pursuit of knowledge in our own lives. This legendary fish reminds us that wisdom is not merely acquired, but earned through experience and perseverance. The Salmon's tale encourages us to seek out truth and enlightenment, just as the Celts did. Even the Puka, with its trickster nature and shape-shifting abilities, finds its way into modern tales and folklore. This mischievous creature, embodying unpredictability and change, serves as a reminder of the chaos and magic that lie just beneath the surface of everyday life. 
The Puka's presence in contemporary stories highlights the enduring appeal of Celtic folklore's playful and enigmatic characters. As the oak tree stands tall, symbolizing strength and endurance, its significance is felt in today's world, where nature's resilience is more important than ever. The oak's ancient wisdom inspires us to stand firm in our convictions and to honor the strength that sustains us through life's challenges. Its legacy reminds us of the enduring power of nature and the virtues of steadfastness and courage. The legacy of Celtic symbols and beings is not confined to the past. It breathes life into our modern world, continuing to influence how we view ourselves and our connection to the world around us. These ancient symbols and myths remind us of a time when humanity and nature were intertwined in a dance of mutual respect and wonder. As we embrace these legacies, we keep alive the spirit of the Celts, finding in their myths and symbols a source of inspiration, comfort, and connection.